So I'm going to talk about reproducible research, and I'm, I'm just going to continue on, actually, with the same stuff that Mark was looking at and uh, talk about this. And part of the problem is what Mark is talked about, right? If you're doing a presentation and you're trying to communicate something, you want to try and keep your code and your data and stuff like that close to the presentation because you'll get it separated and then you just you spend so much time trying to recreate what you did an hour or a day or a week before or something like that. And so there's this notion out there called reproducible research and this is literally copy and paste from Wikipedia. So the main points here are that you know the, the, the goal here is to have the paper, the content, along with the full computational environment and then uh, the, reproduce the results and create new work based on the research. And so anybody who's, um, well, I'll talk more about me. So in my day job, uh, we get a lot of data sets that come in and people say, hey, here's data that I think will help you. And they, they dump this data and oftentimes it's, it's less than pretty. But we have to go through it and try to explore it and you know, plot it, make sense of it, visualize it. And try to figure out how it's going to help us. And so in order to do that, we'll, we'll, we're trying to adopt this reproducible research so that um, when I go back to something I've done or I'm going back to somebody else's work, it, it makes sense and I can run it and it works and we can you know, swap around these things like that. So when you talk about reproducible research, going back to something, these are the things that usually, usually break, right? Not having access to the data, not having access to the code, not having access to what they thinking, right? And then access to the environment. And this is specifically around like our packages. You know, something that was done a year ago might have been done with dplyr.01 beta or something like that. And trying to get back to just that so that the code actually executes is a huge problem, actually. So these are the four things that hopefully we'll try to address. And, and here's sort of how. So when we talk about access to data, um, usually what we do is we set up a directory for a research effort. And the, the directory is really critical so that everything is in there. So we put all of the data in there. We get the, you know, if they give us an Excel document, there'll be an Excel document in there. And then we'll export that to CSV or something, read it up. And then if we do any uh, prepping or cleaning or conversion, any step in there, we're going to put in that same directory. So you, nobody has to wonder, how did you get from here to here, right? And then the code and the thought process are both in Knitter. And uh, are people familiar with Knitter? People use it? Okay. Are people, do, should I cover it a little bit more detail, some people? Okay, good. And then uh, access to the environment. This is actually, there's PackRat, which is relatively new uh, out of our studio. And I, I don't use it, and they just had a webinar. Did anybody, were, did anybody catch that webinar? So one of the things, he, he it crashed a few times on him. And I was like, <laughs> I'm just going to wait for the next version. You know, I'm just going to hold out on that. So we actually don't do anything yet for this. But the, the concepts, Revolution R has a similar thing, but I think it's commercial, where they actually have like a, a localized version of CRAN that you can actually request this and a version. And Revolution R open is they had a personalized version of CRAN. And that's free. OK, so that's open. OK, yeah. So, but the, I mean, that's what these, there are people out there trying to solve that. So, and what, what PackRat does is in, in your packaged environment, it will actually store the libraries. And I don't know about the R binary at all either, but, but it'll store that right in your package. So that when you go and you load it up again, it will load all of the packages that were loaded with that, not what's in your, your normal library. Is that like a Python environment? Kind of, yeah. You could think of it like that. Yep. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm waiting for the next version. <laughs> so here's some other guidelines. Um, as you're doing, as you're creating this stuff, as I'm creating, I try to think of these things about whoever reproduced the work is just as busy and lazy as me, right? They don't want to spend the time to, to think about or create things. They just want it all to be right there. And number two is it'll probably be me anyway, right, <laughs> going back to this. So I really want to be nice to me. And, and chances are, you know, any, anything beyond a week, I probably won't remember much of the details anyway. So I try to put everything in there. And then just assume whoever is looking at it has little to no knowledge, or basically, of anything. And I call this the Mike Knapp principle. And if anybody knows Mike from like 15 years ago in Minneapolis, um, it's named after him. It's a guy I used to have to code for because he, he had very picky, picky uh, 
requirements. So what this all means is that we try to automate everything. So if you're, if you're doing, um, you know, parsing things out of Excel, you get it out of Excel as quickly as possible. At no point in your data prep should there be a step where you have to click something, right? Everything should be in code. Uh, and that way you can check if there's any errors, you can go back and recreate it, redo the export, get back to the source, and recreate it all. Um, and everything is in the code, that's what I'm talking about. There's no clicking at all. And then the last thing is standard directories and file locations. And the other thing is to work incrementally. Like I'm talking about just, you always, every step of the way you're saving stuff, you don't uh, go back to your code and modify it because you're now a step further. You have to take that block, copy it, change it so that it's all sequential in there. And then this last thing, run expensive blocks manually. So like some of the classifiers, this, this one that will run with the Iris data set goes really quick, but if you're working with something that takes hours and hours to run, what I'll do is I'll run it. I'll run it manually, get everything set up, and then the last part in that block, I'll save off that, the classifier object. And then I'll wrap that into something that says, don't evaluate this when you're going in, but just go it, load it off of the directory. So that the computational stuff will be done, um, but the code will be there if you need to recreate it later, right? And then finally, over explain everything, over document, over comment, everything. So um, I'm gonna get out of here and hopefully go uh, this one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up our studio here uh, that way. Wow, that's really tiny. Um, if you have one of those expensive steps, you could write you know, a little simple hit else say, if the file exists, load the file, otherwise do the step that runs all the code and saves the file. Is there a reason not to use the caching that's built into the file? Um, that's a good point. Um, it will depend on if you're totally in our environment where you really go back and forth in your own RFQs. Yes. I mean, if you use the caching, then that's only going to work within the knitter document that you're processing. You know, but if you yeah. want to save an external file that you might use for another purpose, then the knitter caching is going to help you very much. And that's just a quick thing. Mm -hmm. There's a thing called trade, which is like made for data, that you put in your main file, you keep it at, and then if you change a file, it knows where to pick up and go on with it, and if not, you do so all. And that's called Drake? Drake, yeah, it's like data, it's like made for data pipeline processes. Okay. So Interesting. So uh, this is our studio. If people aren't working with our studio, I highly recommend it. But you can go and do a new file and just do an R markdown. Um, I'll just show you where that is real quick. If you're, just, if you're in here, do R markdown. And you'll get a, a blank document in here. So this header, it'll put like four or five default headers. This is a YAML header. And in here, the way that we've set it up, you can create all of these different fields that we want to throw in there, that we want to include in this research. So you have title, subtitle, dates, all sorts of crazy things in there. Um, we try to put a research question in there, what we're going to try and answer with the data, where we're going to head with this data, that sort of thing. And then at the bottom here, there's a spot where we have a, a template. And this template will actually, once you, once you knit this document, once you convert it to HTML, It'll grab this template, and that template says, hey, up on top, grab the, the title field and put the subtitle here. Put the author over here and make this, you know, and you can, you can customize it and put, it, put in CSS, you know, cascading style sheets, things like that, format it. So that template makes this all really pretty. And that's just, it's nice if you ever have to hand this out or anything like that. So I usually start and I'll talk a lot about stuff up here um, this will be relatively brief because I was just doing it as an example. But then I'll load up the messages, and I always do the suppress startup just because it seems like more packages nowadays are having startup messages and stuff like that. You know, there's an um, argument you can specify a bidder saying message equals false. Yep, and I, I do that here. I actually set it down here yeah. as, the, as a default. <clears throat> so that's actually something I wanted to talk about. And I know I could do it here. Okay. Um, you can do it here too. But this is a habit that I just got into, and I. I haven't got out of it. So, but this is, um, you notice I load knitter right here, and then I do this ops chunk set. And within knitter, there's two, two main areas. There's just like a plain text that's a markdown text, and then the R code. And 
like uh, this is specifying that this will be our code in here, and this is just plain text. And so in here, you can put various flags. Uh, but what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, all the flags that I want default, I want these. So I don't have to type these every single time I do an R block. Right? So I set it once at the top, and it'll be set for all the blocks in the document. So that's just the startup stuff. And usually I'll you know, describe here, I'm going to load up the data, something like that. And you can see eval equals false. So if I were doing this the first time, I may want to load up the data, you know, clean it, munge it, do whatever, and then save off a local copy. But then I'm going to set eval, eval equals to false because I only do this once, but all the code is right here. Meaning that when I knit this document, it's just going to skip that whole section. It'll show it because I have echo. I don't have echo equals false, so it'll show it. Um, and then here's the actual first code that I'll run, and this loads that data. So whatever I saved in that block up above manually, now it's going to load it. So it'll do a summary, um, and I create two plots here, just doing some ggplot stuff, and I should use grid arrange to do left and right plots. Um, and actually, let me, let me run this just so that... Wow, they're supposed to be, it's so small. Uh, where's the, is there a knit keyboard thing? This? Yeah. Oh. All right, so that's knitting. Um, and you can see it's doing it in the, in the thing down there. So, um, and that way we can swap between the two and look at the, the differences. So this will, will show a plot. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, as I'm creating this, I'll actually run this stuff manually, look at the plot that shows up over here, and then I'll put some comments underneath that um, and just keep going because it's like an ongoing thought process. So here's the startup. Here's the summary of the data that it loads up. Here's the code to do the plots, and here are the two plots. Okay. So when I'm running this, um, let me just see if I can. So if I run this whole thing here, you should see that over here. Really tiny. That's not much help. <laughs> so but then I'll, you know, it looks like something, something, something. And then here I do the, uh, the actual model. And this is exactly what Mark had in his slides. And outputs a confusion matrix. And it should go fairly quick here. And it'll come down here, this confusion matrix statement. So you can see 33, 31, 30, and this is with all three of the, the species in there. So we haven't changed anything yet. And I, so I just did just random forest, random forest, um, and just showed the confusion matrix on that. Hey, Jay, just a silly question, but when you're specifying model one, is that like in the name of the chunk? Is it just the name of the chunk, or like what is it, what is it serve? When you say model one. Where did I say model one? That was a lot of people talking. In the oh, right, yeah, yeah, that's just a name that I picked. Yeah, because sometimes, um, depending on how you're outputting it, it'll save off, like if this was an image, it'll save off with that name. Otherwise, it'll say chunk one, chunk two, chunk three, and those are not helpful at all. So just say, knowing that this is the first model that I ran, and I can just reference back to here then. So it's just something that you assign. Makes it a little bit more handy. Um, so that ran the confusion matrix, so on and so forth. And then I go in and I do, I change it to the Virginica and other, because that's what we wanted to play with, right? So this is actually, we did this before we put that presentation together, so we pulled it out of here from that. So if I run this code, and this is dplyr, um, taking that, just mutating the species to be either Virginica or other, if it's not Virginica. And then I'll rerun that same thing and look at the confusion matrix. And again, I'm, what I, when I create this, I'm doing this all by hand, but I'm putting the code in there, and then I put my thoughts in after it, and then I figure out where to go next, right? So this is one of the R blocks, and then these three tick marks enter and exit the blocks. So these three tick marks are exiting it. So you can see here, this is fairly good, right? I mean, it's two-thirds are, are accurate, and one-third over here is fairly accurate. And this is, if you remember Mark's model, it was not that accurate. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. There's a reason that we did that. So, because it it's very boring to look at a very successful model like this, so. Um, so yeah, these are pretty boring. I put that right in there. 
Um, so we just looked at the sepal length. There's the, the petal width and length and the sepal width and length in the data set. So we just took out two of the variables. So we got this IRS3 data. And then anytime you do uh, any sort of uh, um, cross-validation or something like that, it's a good idea to set a seed so that you can repeat it. Because remember, it's a, there's a lot of randomness and um, selection like that. So setting that seed makes it so when you go back, you can recreate exactly the same uh, process that you did before. So if I run this, you'll see that it'll be, it'll be far worse because we're just taking two instead of four now. So you can see, got, a, got some error in there. And that makes it more interesting, which is why we did that. Um, and so, I mean, I just bounced between the, the text here and going into here. And so here's the, the rocker code that Mark had in his. And you see, when I do this, it'll just put the plot over here. And again, it's quite tiny. Um, and you can see on this one, it's dipping way down here. So Mark, can you explain that? <laughs> He's, uh, for the recording, he just explained it. You couldn't hear because he couldn't, didn't have a mic. Um, but so on and so forth. I mean, we go through several things here. Um, and then down here, we had the thought, what if we did a different seed? Right? Do we see something different? And sure enough, uh, we just picked 825, uh, just a random number. And we see, and this is actually the, uh, the one that we used in the presentation, right? So but if I go back to this, I mean, you can just look through this and just follow very, very cleanly the thoughts and the code. Uh, got the output right here, um, you know, and it's just going through the thoughts and everything like that. So if you ever have to go back to this, you can literally just, you can click on knit and it'll do it all. Or you can step through like I was doing, like loading up the data running these things, maybe trying a couple of things down on the command line, um, and just going through it. The last thing that I want to point out is at the end, this. This is, this is our, the, the poor way to do PackRat and things like that. So this is just exporting everything that was in my session. So that way, at least I have a shot at recreating all those packages and everything. So what it does in the, in the bottom here uh, this is executed with following code, so it has our version, everything like that. And there's, there's two different ways to do that. There's the default um, session info, or I'm doing the dev tools here, because what dev tools will show you is when things are built from GitHub. So you can see, you know, like, hey, dplyr was built from GitHub, not from CRAN. So if, you, if I wanted to go back and try to recreate this, I would know at least have a, have a fighting shot to know where to go look for some of that code. So on the bottom of every document, you'll see this in our work. So, and that'll show everything in there. Is that all the packages that have to be loaded, whether you're using them or not? Uh, yes. Yeah. And like, there's a lot of things that I'm not using, but I think a lot of the packages that I loaded are using these things. So this is a really long list. Right. Well, carrots so, bring a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty big. So. Any questions on this? I went through a whole bunch of knitter stuff really quick. But it's a really nice tool just to put your thought process, put the code, and just keep going down, keep going down. So it's based on a really basic question. Like that. Only R scripts really well and R markdown, not at all. So knitter and R markdown are like part and parcel of the same thing? Yes. Okay. <coughs> yeah. And so what you're really doing is you're putting kind of a wrapper on it that you can then look at see it in a browser, save it, and then see where you came from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, the, the really neat thing is, if you're in here, there's a keyboard shortcut on, on the Mac. It's Option Command I. And it just puts a block in there. So you don't even have to remember the syntax and stuff like that. But it starts with that R. And then you can put something in here. And you know, R code in here. Yeah. You know. Yep. So like you can see, figure line, you know. Yeah, and you can override the things in there. And there's, a, there's quite a few options in here. A lot of different things that you can do. But I mean, the good thing is like you don't have to know all of these. You can just start doing it, right? The defaults are OK for a lot of this stuff, so yeah. I may have missed this, but does it load the packages every time you run it? 
Yeah, so when, you, when I clicked on knit, it actually started with a clean environment. So even though, even though like I loaded up packages here and I loaded up my data and stuff like that, when you click knit, it starts up a whole new instance. What and it you, starts at the top. Okay, so what if your, your environment is already loaded and you rerun it? What do you mean? It's a No, it goes a different. Whole new R, R session. Spawn. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the. the I mean, it's yeah. kind of a pain. It, it, that's funny. Yeah. I think one thing you could mention is uh, that you can evaluate one chunk at a time. Yeah. So, so up there, you can just do the chunk you're in. And, uh, and that way, that's how you usually develop, and that's how I develop. And then uh, only at the very end do I, or, you know, when I'm going to get a cup of coffee, I, 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 knit, I knit my document right. just to see what it looks like. Yeah. Because otherwise, it takes too long. Yeah. Right. So the idea is reproducible code. <laughs> so, so that's why it wants to start off and respond to other Yeah. Things. So you always start with a clean slate. Yeah. And if you don't want to start with exactly a clean slate, then that's what the caching is for. Yeah. So if you have something that's going to take 12 hours to run or whatever, cache that thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, but if you ever have to update it, well, you know, then you have to re cache. Right. Yep. I'm trying to remember, I think, isn't the XTable written for uh, LaTeX? So is there like another utility library that makes tables work nice and not markdown? There's several, and I think Xtable is one of them. Yeah, so you can use Xtable in here. Yeah. Yeah, but if you have as is and you have output like um, like output from something in text, it, it doesn't do it pretty like this. It makes it, it considered like HTML and if, if they're for being processed in HTML, you can imagine just be all strung together. So you have to be careful between as is and markdown. So is there another question? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I've also found like the, the child chunk option to be really useful. What's the child chunk option? Well, essentially it's kind of like child equals and then have a file name. That file name is another knitter file, and then it will just run that and insert the stuff in there. Wow. So if you have a gigantic document, you can chunk it. You, can, you don't have to have 10,000 lines of code. That's great. Document. You can say, you know, yeah. there's, this section lives in this other document, and this section lives in another document. You know, a really great way to learn is to teach. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Do you have anything for me? Yeah, so there's something. Was that a setup? Because you know the answer? Yes. Because there's, there's a. <laughs> so in here, um, the output HTML, you can do a Word doc or a PDF. And actually, if I did. Up in your net, you can change that. Right, yeah. And if I did a, a new thing, you can see, like, here's a new R markdown. You can say HTML, PDF, or Word. Um, and in here, you can, you can set it. Or if you call knit directly, you can say output to PDF or something like that. So. And the template thing that just came up? Yep, that template. Um, I can swap over to it, actually. Uh, I'll try to. It's just, it'll be HTML, but um, uh, what is it, template? Yeah, so if you can read that, uh, it's really clear. No, but I mean, I'll, I'll try to call some things out. But in here, um, boy, I think it's, it's lower here. But um, if, so like if math is defined, show the math variable for header includes. There's stuff up here, though, in the beginning. There's a lot of stuff between dollar signs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there are a lot of really good examples online. So, and this is a very, very basic one. Um, so, in yeah. addition to you know recreating the research, you could also use this to, to drive template generation you know, for new data sets. So you could have yeah. our search and Bobby and you know, spit out the PDF report. Yep. Yeah. 
So yeah. it's kind of related to this. I'm, I'm wondering, like, I don't know if you, Jay, or, or maybe you, like, is, have you guys seen this being leveraged in a business setting to either for slides, presentations, or reports, analyses that are made on a daily basis? For, for slides and stuff like that, there's the our presentation stuff. But the only time I'll ever do an R presentation is if I'm talking to like an R user group or something, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so. Well, that's not um, what I'm so I think there's, there's a tremendous use case for everyday life where so many businesses just rely yeah. on 50 different Excel reports and email write-ups and whatever else you can actually I, I, I use this many times in business context. Like, presented this to traders and that's what they want. And uh, it's a great kind of, if you have weekly touch base mm -hmm. and they want to know where you are, so one thing I want to talk about real quick is that that HTML output, one of the really great things is that all the images are embedded in the HTML. So if you, this is the HTML, and I don't know if you can read it, but it has script, source <laughs> equals, and here's JavaScript, and the images, basically, I thought that was an image, but it's a script. But... Um, <laughs> So there's, uh, uh, there's images in here. Hopefully, I'll find one soon. Yeah, so I'm in here now. So here's an image and, and sources. I think it has like, yeah, data colon image PNG base64 and then the base64 image. So that means that something like this where there were probably eight or 10 different images in there, it's one HTML file and you can send it out and it'll break uh, IE8, so. <laughs> in your text. Yeah. Um, yep. and, and so every, every time you update a file or something, you know, you're going to yeah. get that meme. You're gonna get, That's right. Yeah. And I've done that before. Yeah, so like, I'm trying, trying to really describe it, yeah. trying to describe the data. And so it's just a back tick R and then the little thing in there. So I'll say, like, there are so many, so many observations in there, and it'll be dynamic. So every time it's run, it'll, if I update the data, that will update as well. So and it's right in the, in the text, not the R blocks. And you can, you can dump all of the, the, the figures into a separate uh, directory. Yeah, you can. And I was actually going to mention, I, I, I often, at the end, when it's about to get presented to some executive, what the, what the person that I'm working for will do is take the, take the document, take the directory of, of uh, pictures, and then turn it into PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> Executivize it, and then yeah. present that. So, so it, it actually works okay as a, you know, it, it's working down as we go, and then when they want to present something to a higher up, they, they go ahead and turn it into it's really the cool. standard PowerPoint. <laughs> so, yeah. You can also yeah. set the exact dimensions of the output. So, in my world, I mean, I got a PhD just to be able to write PowerPoint. It's pretty terrible. But <laughs> you're the only one. I know, right? I think all of us communicate in PowerPoint. It's embarrassing. But like, I set the dimensions for that so that when it all outputs, it makes it really, really easy to chip into the PowerPoint without any adjustments at all. So you just said insert, you click the thing, and you can throw the PowerPoint back in 30 seconds. Yeah. You set the dimensions on what kind of template? Right in here. But yeah. Uh, uh, a, PDF. A, a PDF or a yeah. HTML? Oh, or well, I'll do a PDF, but then I'll also put in here, I'll, I'll have the separate output to a .png file. Okay. So that it's like in, in within each one of these, and coding that out, and then setting each one of these to a, knowing that down the road, I'm not going to want to run the whole thing, just to have to build the thing and then copy it. Okay. So. The other, the other real cool thing that I want to mention is that um, in, in newer versions, and, and there's a new package out that'll be out real soon, I'm sure, called ggviz. Um, and what it, what it does, you can actually do that in here, and it'll output JavaScript, and it actually is interactive then. So in that, in that HTML output, you can actually mouse over and, and do cool stuff like that. So I'm sure it's coming real soon. <laughs> so any other questions? Yep. Yeah, well, I was going to make a big comment because I, I just started using this um, and I discovered that um, if you're embedding the, uh, if you're knitting to Word, uh, that uh, you'll, it'll break the, the graphics if you specify the figure width and figure height. And really? it doesn't tell you that unless you, I guess, read through some of the documentation or find that you're not allowed to specify that in Word. Um, but just basically produces documents. You look through it and find out that there's no graphs 
<laughs> That's why. You know. Okay. So if you're um, doing word, don't specify the figure width yeah, or height. So or the, the, I mean, the, the unfortunate workaround is just that you just have to have them generated as is, and then you have to go in and adjust the size of the word. Oh, it. okay. It also doesn't worry about wrapping that. You know, your text starts at the end of the graph and all that. And that's, that's another reason that I'll do the, um, the thing at the top where I specify all my options here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So essentially here I would just take these out. Right. That way I don't have to hit every block. And I, I learned that a really hard way. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I, maybe someone knows maybe there's a better way to do this, but I um, went to Markdown, or there's a YAML option just to keep Markdown. And then I use GitHub, and that's a lot of my files are called readme.car Markdown. So that when I meant to, uh, or when I upload to GitHub, I have a readme.markdown, which becomes like sort of a, uh, a splash page for that repository. Yep. Right. It's kind of a convoluted way to do it. I don't know if anybody there, I don't know much about it, but there is uh, one of the targets is GitHub Markdown. I don't know if you've looked at that. So there's, I don't know what it does, and I use it when I'm putting it to GitHub, but I, I don't know what it does. But there's, I was really amazed when I saw it. I was like, wow, specifically for GitHub. All right, why don't we take a five minute break or something, and then Ben will get up and we'll. Uh, have him talk. Thank you.